Hello, um, I'm Iona McCleary and I was asked if I could do a recording of my talk from last week as the, the recording um, that should have been done wasn't, didn't work. So I'm, I'm giving the talk again. Um, it may be different because I don't speak from a script, but I hope it is still enjoyable. So I shall just share my screen. Um, and those of you who were there for the talk will be aware that I had problems with my slides. So hopefully that won't happen again. So hopefully we can see these slides. So the healthy medieval diet. Um, just to start very briefly with some definitions by medieval, um, I really am very broad minded, the period between the, the 6th and the 16th century. Um, I cover that quite often in my research and teaching, um, although increasingly towards the end of that time period these days. Um, the words um, Diet needs a little bit of thought, and then I will spend most of this talk interrogating what is meant by the word healthy. Um, I am um, by training a medical historian, and my work um, primarily brings together um, food and health, although I do look at aspects of the history of medicine and history of health um, more widely. Um, so I got interested in the word diet for a number of reasons. Um, one was actually chatting to a very small child at a festival, food festival, where I was running a stall. And I said to her, what kind of diet do, do you have? And she said to me very wisely, I'm not on a diet. Obviously, I learned a lot about how to speak to five year olds um, at that time, but um, it did get me thinking about the different interpretations of the word diet in English. Um, I turned to the Oxford English Dictionary, which of course I tell my students they shouldn't do as a starting point for research, but it can sometimes be quite useful. And I found that the word diet um, does come into English. It's originally um, Greek and then Latin comes into French and then English during the Middle Ages as early as the 13th century. And you can see on this slide um, it has a wide range of meanings from a whole course of life, a way of living or thinking, um, a way of feeding, um, a restricted prescribed course of food for those who are ill or in prison. Um, it can mean a food generally, which is what I think I meant when I asked that small child um, her, her kind of food, what she liked eating. And then to two diets, which is how she interpreted it, um, to regulate one's own diet, is actually 17th century. So it is quite late. Now, of course, it will um, have different meanings in different languages. I spend most of my time uh, working on medieval Portugal um, and there, um, particularly the writings of King Duarte of Portugal. This is his tomb, that of himself and his wife. Um, and he writes quite extensively about, uh, about health, about food. He creates recipes or compiles recipes rather, I'll come back to that. Um, he, does, um, he does use the word dieta, but the word that he uses most frequently is that of regimento or regimen. Um, and this is more closely associated with uh, meanings one um, and three, really, a little bit of four. Um, but the idea of a whole course of life, a medical regimen, um, actually explores the whole lifestyle of the individual, not just their food. So that's diet. Healthy. Healthy is something that's often taken for granted um, when looking at the history of medicine or when looking at the history of food. And what I wish to do today is to, to really think about how um, healthy um, has a variety of different meanings if we look at different modern disciplines and if we take seriously what medieval people said about food. <laughs> 
and healthy um, ways of life. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, I, I ran a, a project called You Are What You Ate um, between 2010 and 2014. And this brought me into contact uh, with a wide range of people from different disciplines. I co-organised this project with um, Vicky Sherman of Wakefield Museums and Joe Buckbury of Archaeological Sciences in Bradford. And we also worked um, with reenactors, with food scientists and nutritional epidemiologists. So I'll give you a sense of how some of those um, those groups of people um, have, have helped me in my work. Um, some of you will of course recognise Ivan Day there up in the top uh, left image. Um, but I, I, I learned um, I think how to communicate um, and how to engage and it really transformed my life this project. I wasn't a food historian when I started out. Food was always there in the background of my week, my work but I would say now that I have a food habit I now see food in everywhere even in text that I knew for years and then rereading learned that I had to rethink um, what I thought I knew about uh, about the history of food and indeed the history of health. I carried on doing a range of public engagement projects in subsequent years. Um, this was an exhibition which ran also working in conjunction with, with Wakefield Council. We went to two hospitals and um, quite a number of libraries in Leeds and Wakefield. This was with a, a team of people um, at the University of Leeds that looked at health um, from the 15th century to modern times. I like to involve my students where I can. So the top two images here relate to big events in Leeds on campus and um, doing a range of different activities. Bottom right, I helped run a workshop for youth leaders for the Young Archaeologists Club. Um, and bottom left there, I was making saltpeter in Denmark a few years ago. A lot of these things ground to a halt in 2018 because I took on a very large um, administrative role in my department at the University of Leeds, um, which thanks also to COVID has really also taken over my life um, in the last year. So I hope eventually to get back to two projects like this and indeed doing a lot more research. I don't have a great deal of time now, so very much welcome this opportunity to sort of think through some of my ideas and future directions at the moment. So I started thinking about um, what do we mean by healthy when we think about food. Partly as a consequence of an interview. Um, I was interviewed by a Yorkshire Evening Post journalist um, five, five, well, six years ago now. Um, and it was a nice interview, but one of the quotations that ended up in the newspaper was this one. In medieval times, peasants ate far more healthily than their rich counterparts by living on seasonal produce. Now, of course, this is an, a misunderstanding because of course, the rich also ate seasonally. Medieval rich people couldn't fly in their blueberries from Mexico. They didn't have supermarkets. They also um, needed to subsist um, and, and in, engage in trade in seasonal markets, mainly for grain and all, of the, all the other types of produce. But it got me thinking about uh, really what's being echoed here is this paradox of the healthy medieval peasant diet. I, I am aware when I say this that uh, peasant society or village society in medieval England was highly stratified and very, very diverse. So I'm very aware that this is a generalisation. But the, the, the the diet of the poorest uh, people in England, mixed grain breads, darker breads, darker grains, um, 
fruits and vegetables, but very little meat, um, probably sounds quite familiar to us because, of course, this is what is recommended to us today as a healthy diet. And yet, um, we all know that life expectancy was much lower um, in the Middle Ages than today, and to a great extent, that is um, because of diet. Um, perhaps not having enough food, but also um, thinking about the types of food that they were able to eat at certain times. And the issue that I really was thinking about here is by whose standards are we to judge medieval healthiness or medieval healthy diet? Our ideas or those of medieval people? And of course, those also would vary across time. So it is actually quite complex to think about what is a healthy diet. And defining health today and routes to improving health, these are fairly well established. So we would expect um, to see that a society that has plenty of good quality food, and water, a clean, safe environment, reduced incidence of disease, improve life expectancy, uh, low child mortality, and reducing the risk of obesity, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and other chronic illnesses. And quite a lot of these are related to diet. They're also, to a large extent, some of these related to aspects of modern lifestyle. And some of these conditions only really became major health conditions in the 20th century onwards and were not um, particularly a problem in the Middle Ages, except perhaps amongst elite people. And even then, some of these conditions are related to things like the smoking of tobacco, which did not exist in the Middle Ages. And then the final thing is you know, thinking about improved mental well-being and greater resilience. And of course, we're doing our best to try and understand how to improve that um, at the moment. The World Health Organization has a very, had a, a very familiar, um, very famous definition of health, which was established after the Second World War, but also one that is quite controversial. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. If you can find anyone in this state, please let me know, and then we can work out what they have and we can bottle it and become rich and famous. I doubt that there is anyone in this state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. And indeed, it's been suggested that this is as good a definition of happiness, perhaps, um, not just of health. So it is not necessarily straightforward and uncontroversial to define health to today, even if we have an idea about how to achieve it. How do we know when we have got there? Some of the approaches to a healthy diet today, which I found extremely influential, are these ones. And this is partly through my work um, with um, other people on the UR UAIDS project, and also subsequently particularly working um, with bioarchaeologists in York and Sheffield, as well as Bradford. I've done some work on medieval famine and I've become very interested in nutritional and um, epidemiology. Um, so I'm going to work through what these disciplines think or suggest about healthy diet and then I will apply them to the Middle Ages. There's quite a lot of information and different theoretical approaches here, so please bear with me. Gary Williamson was one of the um, people involved in the URWU8 project, a food scientist, now based in Australia. And he did a lot of work on um, various types of foods, um, amongst other things, which um, he describes as lifespan essential foods. Um, all these beautiful berries, um, but also things like dark chocolate and red wine. And in the press, these got uh, picked up as superfoods, a term that he didn't particularly like, but one that is certainly catchy. This got me thinking about medieval superfoods, but of course we immediately start running into a problem because these are the types of things that actually medieval people might consider as superfoods, sugar, which we do not see as healthy today, 
um, and spices, which we see as having a negligible nutritional effect. So you can um, study what the effects of a, a large scale intake of some of these ingredients would be. But in um, most foods that we have today, they are used in very small amounts as flavorings. Um, they were very, very expensive, both of these in the Middle Ages, and therefore mainly consumed by the very rich um, and um, seen as um, elite and important to both food and to medicines. So sugar was seen as a well-balanced foodstuff that was actually ideal for dishes for the sick. One of the other things I learned um, from Gary's work was, was thinking at uh, longer scale. So this is a, a graph that he produced for a conference paper that we gave at the International Medieval Congress together in 2011. Um, and the point about this graph here is that if you go back over 50,000 years, um, one of the major issues is thinking about will we eat today and the effects of having any food at all. As there's more food around, improved uh, medicine, healthcare, food distribution, it starts to mean that people live longer. So we now get to a stage where we are at now, and when we got to that stage, um, can be debated, um, where we can choose what shall we eat today is our main preoccupation. But as we've moved through this process, there's an increased risk of chronic illnesses associated with age and that process of living longer. And some of those um, are linked to food and lifestyle. So I started to think about how could I apply this approach to the Middle Ages. The life expectancy of a medieval English peasant, and I'm focusing on England here just because there's been a lot of work done on this, and this graph is based on research by Christopher Dyer, and he suggests um, that a medieval English peasant, in that generalised sense, um, aged 20 in 1300, um, would have about 20 years more to live. But by 1500, they might have 40 more years to live. We calculate life expectancy from the age of 20 here because life expectancy for, for, from birth um, is so problematic. At some points, 50% of babies will die before the age of five. So that does skew uh, life expectancy graphs quite considerably. Um, the main reason put forward by Dyer and others is that uh, the, this improvement here is associated with an improved diet, particularly having more food as we go through this period. But this period is, is one that is quite fraught in a number of ways. At the same time, there is a sense of an ideal life expectancy. This is uh, scriptural from the, the Christian Bible, the idea of uh, three school years and ten. Um, so there was a sense that human beings were supposed to live beyond the age of 20 or indeed five and live beyond infancy. That was, that was well understood. Medieval people knew that. We have the challenge of the Great Northern Famine here. Now I study southern Europe, so famine does in fact have a very different pattern in southern Europe, but if you lived in, in Yorkshire, um, periods of rainfall, um, animal disease, um, very serious problems um, here which may have killed at least 10% of the population. We also have plague so the arrival of what is known as the Black Death arrived in Yorkshire in, in 1349, in fact. Um, so but despite these problems, um, some might argue that the plague, in fact, uh, led to an improvement in diet amongst the survivors. This is a much debated topic. Um, people do seem to be living longer. And what you do start seeing and the same way as you saw on the graph that, um, that, that, that Gary used, is increasing um, health problems associated with longer lifespan. 
um, and some of these will be associated with actually having a lot more food but not necessarily having more of um, certain types of it perhaps um, is also something to be found in higher status um, communities and families. So I'll move on to my next discipline which is bioarchaeology. As I said, this is um, work that I've done with um, colleagues in York, Bradford and Sheffield over the last decade or so. I have a definition of, of bioarchaeology there from the University of York's web page. Um, there's a whole range of things that you can study thinking about biological traces that are left, um, not just traces of human beings, um, but that is what I'm going to focus on. So one of the insights here, just to return to sugar, um, Joe Buckbury produced this graph for one of our exhibitions on the URU8 project um, and can show how consumption of sugar increases in the post-medieval period really quite massively and goes completely crazy in the 19th century, um, largely because of the use of sugar beet rather than sugar cane. Um, and although there's a slight increase in the Middle Ages, it is a very small amount. And what she's plotted here is the caries rate, which um, can be seen in, in skeletal populations and how that increases in parallel with the consumption of sugar. So rotten teeth were not as common in the Middle Ages as they will be in the 19th and 20th century. So just to warn you, the next slide shows what happens if you really don't look after your teeth. This kind of thing is not in fact as common in the Middle Ages. Other types of tooth problems might be, but, but this is this is quite this is this abscess here and this kind of tooth decay is more rare, is rarer. Other things that interest me about what can be discovered from the skeleton, and I do reiterate, this is not my own research, this is what I've learned from working um, with colleagues and also the scholarship of people like Sharon DeWitt. Um, this, these images are from um, a, a mass grave, a trauma grave, which was discovered in London, I think discovered in the 1990s. And it wasn't until um, quite a bit later when radiocarbon dating was possible um, that it was shown that it was not a plague grave, as had originally been assumed, um, because it was a century out in dating. Um, and it, it, it caused a bit of consternation because what would have caused um, this many deaths um, in the 13th century um, probably in around about 1250s, a time um, when London is in fact uh, really seen as very prosperous. Very recently, um, it's been shown that there was a volcanic eruption in Indonesia, um, probably the biggest eruption of the last thousand years, which effectively lowered global temperatures sufficiently for harvest to fail um, in the late 1250s in the south of England. And this is what happened. This is a famine grave. And these are people who perhaps uh, may have been migrated to the city of London um, and who succumbed. And as uh, is the case even today, as cities grew and became more prosperous, the gap between rich and poor widened um, and these, this population became extremely vulnerable to even quite short periods of harvest fluctuation. What you can do with skeletons like this is study the, 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 the lifespan malnutrition um, of these individuals and the, the struggle that they had uh, really since childhood onwards. And although these these teeth don't come from um, this London site. Uh, this is one of the collection curated in Bradford. Um, oops, sorry. Um, you can see one of the signs that our bioarchaeologists look for, which is the enamel hyperplasia, these lines here, um, which indicate that this individual effectively stopped growing um, in childhood because of infection um, of malnutrition 
Um, so these are the kinds of things amongst other types of lesions that bioarchaeologists will look for. But it leads me to um, what is known as the osteological paradox. These individuals are adults. They lived with these health problems and they grew up with them from childhood. Um, they would therefore be described as unhealthy by our modern standards. A skeleton with no lesions and no obvious signs of ill health would though have been somebody cut down perhaps by an acute disease or killed in some other way. Um, unhealthy in that they have died of a disease um, or an injury, but um, were not able to live the nature of that condition, whatever it was. Um, who's better off? So this is the osteological paradox, that an unhealthy skeleton is somebody who has actually been resilient. Um, their, their, their biological system has been resilient, but also so has their family and their community. And in some cases, they have required long term care in order to grow up um, and to continue in that situation. The other concept there, heterogeneous frailty, is this sense that even within a single community where the living conditions might indeed have been very similar, people respond to illness differently. Some people survive and some people do not, even though their diet um, and their, their, their community may be very similar. And that is something that is of great interest um, today to geneticists as well as to bioarchaeologists. And there will, there will be a great deal of future research in that area. And to what extent is it that personal resilience, well-being um, and family care that, that might aid um, this heterogeneity? Heterogeneity, sorry. Sorry, I should have done a little warning with this slide. Um, so this is just an example, although it's not dietary related exactly, and again, this is not my research, but I have found this extremely useful in my teaching. Um, so this is um, from Isla Fay's um, book on health in Norwich, where the modelling of um, the leg of somebody with Hansen's disease that's better known as leprosy, trying to imagine what would this leg look like in life? Um, how impaired would it have been? And then how much care would this individual have required? And they would have lived with this disease for years to have had this level of impairment um, and to have adapted to living with that condition. So it does make us think. And then this is another case of somebody with leprosy um, but from Winchester. Um, so the other one's from Chichester. Um, and this individual here with the build-up of calculus on the teeth, um, most of the um, sort of the cleaning of our, our inside of our mouth uh, is done by our cheek in its normal movement. This individual um, may have been paralysed by the condition that they had, and therefore this caused the, the calculus to build up here. And of course, some of these um, conditions do raise questions. Um, would the individual have been able to feed themselves or not? Um, another area that's very influential in, um, in bioarchaeology is, um, well, two areas, is thinking about stable isotopes and, and zooarchaeology. And this, this work here relates to the work of two students, one of whom I, I co-supervised, um, Ali Chitoso, and another student, Veronica Anacetti. Um, and Aliche's work really was absolutely fascinating. So one of the things that she's able to determine from um, analysing the chemical traces within um, teeth and bones are things like when was a baby weaned? How long was it breastfed? Um, the babies that she was, the, the adults that she's analysing, you can actually um, plot when they, when breastfeeding ended, usually around the ages of two or three, and then, then their nutritional health just dropped off a cliff at that point because infants were usually weaned onto very low quality foodstuffs, porridge, pap, that kind of thing. 
Um, so there's a wide range of other things that can be determined. Um, and then Veronica's work on animal, animal bones, um, animal husbandry, how animals were killed, how they were reared, uh, the size of animals, all sorts of different things that could be determined. And in both cases, um, both students were looking at differences between Muslim and Christian communities, one in Portugal and the other in Sicily. So really, really fascinating work. Alice also was very aware of plants that we know as C4 plants. They photosynthesize differently. They leave different traces on the body. Um, and millet and sugarcane um, and sorghum um, are ones that are not uh, Millet and sorghum are not well studied, and I will come back to those later as neglected plants that are very important staples in some parts of the world. The next area that's been influential is, is famine. This is partly because I, I started to think about food shortages um, in the context of medicine. And famine is uh, seemingly rather neglected within um, the study of the history of medicine in the Middle Ages. So I did, I did a work on a, a research paper on this topic. And this caused me to do a lot of reading on modern approaches to famine and food security today. That top quotation there, that is a very standard approach. Um, that food security occurs when all people are able to access enough safe and nutritious food to meet their requirements for a healthy life. And usually um, what's counted as safe and nutritious food is something that is determined by, by scientists and nutritionists. Um, and often there's a focus on, on calorie intake and things like that. Although calories were developed um, the late 19th and the early 20th century in the United States, they had a, quite a, a major um, political role. Um, they are a construct to a great extent. So we need to be careful when we apply this to um, past peoples. And of course, um, when you have a top-down approach, um, when somebody external says, this is nutritious, you must eat it, that kind of approach often doesn't work. Some of you may remember when Jamie Oliver tried this with school children in Rotherham, not very successfully. Um, so more recent approaches, actually, um, cultural approaches, are very aware of the importance of looking at history, and looking at socio-economic processes when thinking about famine research. So that's an example from that middle publication. Um, and then a broader sense of the concept of food well-being, when there's choice, when foods are not just calor calorically and nutritionally satisfying, but also socially, culturally, ecologically, subjectively satisfying. And I found this actually very influential, although some of these papers um, published subsequent to my own published paper, which I'm cheekily, cheekily quoting here. But the insight that I got even in 2016 was that food security includes cultural perceptions, identities, attitudes and tastes. It's the food one both wants and needs. Um, so. I think there's probably much more to do on this in relation to food shortages uh, and moving away from the very objective approach to, to famine, which is uh, often quite dominant in research and for the Middle Ages and for later periods. The next discipline is nutritional epidemiology. Um, Janet Cade was another one of the people working on the URW Rape Project, whose work I've continued to follow. Um, nutritional epidemiology is the scientific study of, of nutrition in, in whole populations. So Janet's works with the, cancer, the Women's Cancer Cohort Study. Very important work looking at a group of women over more than 20 years now, um, analysing their, in, their food intake but also they're very, very much broader lives uh, and, and illnesses. And she's done a lot of work, and her and her group at Leeds, on, on children's food and food practices. 
So things like if you fidget more, if you sit at table as a family, both of these in actual fact are likely to lead to a healthier diet. One article I found very useful, this, this one, which uh, um, from about 10 years ago or more now, looking at uh, Leeds uh, and taking uh, one region of Leeds, which is considered to be more deprived, one that's considered to be really quite wealthy and one in the middle, and looking at a range of determinants which affect childhood obesity. And what was surprising is it's not really, it's not the poorest area that has the most problems in relation to childhood obesity. Um, the idea of the neighbourhood matters in this particular title, it's just a phrase that really um, caused me to think about how the neighbourhood affects social cohesion and can affect well-being and support networks. So Again, I've tried to apply this to the Middle Ages. I tried to think about social determinants of health. So there has been historical approaches to this, one particularly useful book here. And the social cohesion of neighbourhoods measurably affects rates of disease. That relates also to that sense that some people get ill and some do not within the same neighbourhood. What is it? that affects that is extremely difficult to pin down. And the other thing I think that's very significant to think about for the Middle Ages is the role of faith. I found very influential um, this interdisciplinary article from a journal called Natural Hazards, um, I think produced by an archaeologist and a geographer, um, thinking about how medieval society uh, may have not been the best protected or the best resourced, but perhaps was not the most frightened. And of course, as we go through our own crisis today um, in relation to disease and the environment, um, how, we, how we think about it in our very secular world um, is perhaps worth reflecting. In fact, are we less able to cope with crisis today than medieval people were? So what were the social determinants of health in the Middle Ages? I mean, to some extent, they were the same as today in terms of, you know, the kind of access to water and, and where you live and those types of things. Um, but medieval people had their own views. Um, and these are six things which are very influential in my thinking about health in the Middle Ages. And as you can see, food and drink are there. And indeed, in medical texts that go through these six things, food and drink is usually the most prominent aspect. So the six non-naturals. These were um, based on ideas in Galen, the physician writing, a Greek physician writing in the Roman Empire in the second century of our era. And then they were developed um, much more fully by Hunayn ibn Ishaq, who was a Christian working in, in Baghdad in the ninth century. And they became immensely popular, whether it was in, um, in university texts in Christian Europe, um, throughout the Middle East and the Islamic world, and, and you find them moving beyond medical texts into um, everyday life in towns, um, and, and you find references to them in letters and in all sorts of contexts. They're known as the non-naturals to differentiate them from the naturals, for example, the organs of the body. They're external factors which affect the body. So the air is perhaps best uh, um, translated as environment, everything that might affect you externally, uh, including you know, whether you have a marshland near you, uh, where, the, where the sunlight is coming into your house, etc. And they do interact, so medical texts will actually think about whether sleep and exercise are suitable before and after meals. The other thing that medieval people um, thought about a great deal in relation to uh, health are the four humours, which are perhaps better known. The humours are amongst the naturals. Um, four of these, uh, black bile was probably the last to be developed. Um, there was a 
a fondness of numerology and four things, so the four things matched and the four elements that were already established. When I gave this um, talk, um, when there was an audience, um, somebody did point out afterwards that within Chinese medicine there are five principles. That's also the case within um, Ayurvedic medicine, I believe. Um, but here we have four things, and this was the widespread um, belief in the Islamicate and um, Christian and Judaic um, traditions. Um, and everything, um, plants, humans, planets, had a mixture of the four qualities of hot, cold, um, wet and dry. And this had quite a profound effect on foods. Um, it was also understood that having too much of one thing um, could create illness. So both with the six non-naturals and with this, um, moderation was key. Excess or a lack um, could make somebody ill. So in terms of the effect on food, his wonderful manuscript, the Taquinum Sanitatus, illustrates this very well. Um, we have here a whole range of foods which are either cold and wet or cold and dry, um, and therefore deemed unhealthy in medieval thinking. There's plenty of evidence that these foods were caught, farmed, bought and eaten. Um, there is quite a lot of debate about this. Um, I think one of the things it's worth reflecting on is that if all we had, if all future historians had in 500 years time were NHS leaflets warning us that, that drinking too much alcohol or eating uh, certain types of fats too much or eating too much chocolate were unhealthy, they would assume that um, we followed that advice if that was all that was available to those future scholars to study. And that's the equivalent here. If all we have is health guidance, we might assume that people followed it. Um, but there is actually a lot of evidence that these foods were eaten, but there was actually quite a lot of reflection on their healthiness and the risks associated with them. So I try and think extremely broadly about healthy diet now in my research. Um, I try and draw on these modern disciplines, but also think about the very broad scope um, of medieval people when thinking about health. I'm quite influenced by this quotation from the 7th century uh, and this idea that medicine is not just um, what we would see as medical skills carried out by a physician, but also food and drink, shelter and clothing. Every defence and fortification by which our body is kept safe. This is really influential. I now have a lecture for my students where I think about actually medieval housing, um, thinking much more broadly about attitudes towards food than I perhaps did when I first started out on my teaching career. The other thing I think about a great deal is spiritual health. I'm really fond of this image of gluttony, which is from um, a much larger um, set of images of the seven sins, which might originally have been a tabletop. Um, and here we have eating in a very undisciplined fashion, a lot of food, much more than you'd often find in depictions of the medieval table. So spiritual food, spiritual health um, is really important. To a great extent, uh, spirituality, uh, religion was seen as a form of medicine, as a form of therapy, as a route towards well-being, as we might say in the Middle Ages. So we need to take it very seriously. But we also need to think about how religion guided food intake, periods of year, days when people were not supposed to eat in, in, in most religions um, and a range of uh, regulations about food practices more broadly. And I think you know, we must not forget this. We do have to take this absolutely seriously when we're thinking about a healthy diet and thinking very much about that relationship between what is physically healthy and spiritually healthy 
that sense of wholeness requires holiness and healthiness combined. Um, and these are things I think that perhaps we have sometimes forgotten about today. So I'll now move on the rest of this talk. I will just discuss some of the directions of my own research. So what I'm really trying to do, and a lot of this is drawing on um, all the different people who have influenced my work. I'm thinking about food provision as part of community health or health scaping. This is a modern concept popularised by Guy Geltner for medieval medicine, this idea that medieval people were quite capable of recognising when there are problems with the healthiness of their environment, whether that is improving their food supply, regulating medicine, having better streets. Um, and you can think about food um, as part of that uh, healthscaping. So this is something I'm doing for Portugal, which I'll, I'll show you an example shortly. Um, I'm looking a lot at food in miracle collections. I won't talk about this very much today, but I've been looking at the role of fish um, and miracles as sources for fish consumption um, and looking at attitudes about food and illness um, and their relationship quite a bit in food. Um, Building on my work on Portugal, I've been increasingly looking at Portugal's early empire in West Africa and the Atlantic Islands, looking at food and illness in European narratives, uh, visits to um, West Africa, um, and, and really trying to ensure that we don't um, take those European ideas for granted and just read these texts simplistically as a way of accessing ideas about American, African foods. Um, drawing on um, work that's been done on American foods and actually now applying this to 15th century Africa. And then finally thinking about elite attitudes towards diets because that's the best documented attitudes but actually trying to read through that um, sort of sense of population healthiness, looking at charity distribution networks and the broader application of medical advice in everyday practice. So an example of food in healthscaping. Um, this is a small town um, north of Porto um, and it is very much dominated by the nunnery of Santa Clara, that particular um, monastic complex that you can see in this photograph is uh, post-medieval, but uh, in the Middle Ages, the, the abbess of Santa Clara was more or less in charge of this small town. Um, in the early 16th century, this town had 905 householders. So however you extrapolate from the number of houses, um, we still have a population of less than 5,000. Um, and in 1466, we have from that year um, the only surviving book of minutes from the council meetings for this town. Council minutes or minutes of any kind can be quite frustrating sources. You'll probably know yourself if you've ever read minutes of meetings that you were actually at. You will know that that sentence in the minute probably hides an entire hour of argument. So they can be quite misleading. But so this is what I've gleaned from the healthscaping of 1466 in Ville So as you will see, I've looked at everything. When I first used this uh, text, I was just looking for medical practice. So I was only interested in the fact that plague arrived in July and there was a quarantine imposed. I then became interested in food. This is a small town which has piped water. It has fountains that they maintain. Food appears and is regulated all the way through, so they're regulating both the live animals and 
and the, the, the dead meat for sale and the, the practices of those doing the butchering and the selling. I then started to see other things that were interesting. So the concern about the ferry boats and the fact that two months later they have repaired it. So they are actually active. This town is doing things. And I also reflected on religious things. So uh, banning work in the horticultural areas on Sundays and feast days, and also thinking about um, the town's Corpus Christi procession. I came to the conclusion that all of these things interact with each other in terms of thinking about the social cohesion of this town and its overall well-being at a, t at a time a year which was perhaps pretty stressful. As you can see in the autumn there is a, a conflict with the neighbouring town which may be cause some stress um, and by October quarantine is lifted because it is affecting the salt trade. Moving from the town um, council to a higher level of society, in fact the top level, I'll return to King Duart. And I spent quite a bit of time studying and translating his recipes and his uh, interest in regimen. He produces a regimen for the stomach um, and really quite a large number of recipes for plague but also for diarrhoea and I really one day will write an article um, about diarrhoea. Uh, lots of medieval information on it but it's not really attracted any modern interest, I wonder why. He produces quite a lot of food recipes but he sees them as medicinal and that is something that interests me. Um, the relationship between food and medicine is a very fine one. And so some of the, the dishes that he refers to, which sound like food, um, but are good for his stomach, are goat's liver in red wine vinegar, egg yolks and vinegar, roasted partridge feet in red wine, um, roast turtle doves with wax, an interesting one. Um, I made this one, um, which as you can see, looks a little bit like a chocolate truffle. Um, it, it, it smells and probably tastes of rose. Um, it smelled lovely actually, but uh, I didn't taste it because the Armenian bowl that I had, I bought um, from an artist supplies website and it did say do not eat on it. And so I wasn't quite sure, but I did make his eggs with mastic and eggs with sumac, which is also very nice. Um, so really fascinating guy. Um, for a king to be doing this in the 1430s, extremely unusual. If he'd been an Italian merchant, not unusual at all. Um, so I do want to do a lot more work on this and, and, and publish some of this. Um, it's not helped by the fact that the, the manuscripts that survive of these recipes are um, the date from around 1600. We do not have his original commonplace book, which is quite frustrating. But what I want to do is really move from um, royal diet to nutritional epidemiology on, um, on a national and, yet, and then beyond that to an imperial and global scale. King Duas actually referred to uh, the health of the people is the health of the prince and the prince ought very much to love his health. He's drawing here on the very influential um, Secret of Secrets, which is um, pseudo Aristotle's text, which all kings and princes read in the Middle Ages. Um, but he very much uh, incorporates this into his own sense of his role and his responsibility to his people. And this sense of the people, the povo in Portugal, and going back to those council meetings and also in chronicles, how are they thinking about the health of the community? How does the king's regulations, he's one of the, the, the earliest medical 
um, regulations survive from his reign in terms of the licensing of medical practitioners. So how does all these things interconnect? And then in King Duarte's lifetime, um, the Portuguese royal family decides to invent Africa. And in 1415, um, we have what's usually seen as the beginnings of the Portuguese empire. Um, not only does that uh, process need provisioning, um, but we need to think about the, the, the health impacts and the, the food exchange um, consequences of this European expansionism in Africa. Um, and the effect, uh, this two-way effect affecting Portugal and also affecting um, the West African um, kingdoms and territories that the Portuguese visit by the end of the 15th century. Um, that's a book of hours that I'm showing you here. This was produced in Northern Europe for the Portuguese royal court. As you can see, there is more than one individual of African background in the image. And in the 16th century, something like 10% of Lisbon was had probably originated from Africa. So I'm increasingly thinking about food in West Africa. This is a photograph I took in uh, Cabo Verde. Um, wonderful market stall, but pretty well everything in this photograph does not come from Cabo Verde. And indeed, because of the nature of the drought there in, reach, in, in, in the last decade, um, couldn't have been grown on the island probably. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to explore um, food exchange, the types of food that were, were produced in West Africa, um, and then also thinking about um, what medieval Europeans thought of these foods. There's been a great deal of work on food exchanges across the Atlantic, lots and lots of interest in American foods coming um, to the old world, and quite a lot of them are in this image, the chilies, the peppers, the tomatoes, the pineapple. Um, but nobody really thinks about uh, African food in this same sense. To some extent, African foods were much more familiar to the Portuguese as they travelled. But these, most of these have not received the kinds of uh, interest that they deserve, and yet they are major, major food staples, some of these um, in large parts of the world. Grains of Paradise, which is a, a peppery spice, these are the seed pods in which you'll find the actual spice that's used. Um, they were um, sought after in European markets, can be found in, in Northern Europe from the 13th century at least. There's been no major study of their trade um, and exchange, but they are a product from West Africa. Um, Black-eyed peas are one of the few old world um, beans. They are taken across the Atlantic and become a staple um, in the Americas. Um, very important, very important in Portuguese cuisine, in fact, and very, very well established in West Africa. Sorghum and millet, um, these are two foods which are C4 plants um, and probably were eaten by the poor in medieval Portugal. My student, Lichi Toso, um, thinks that they're probably more commonly eaten by um, poorer Muslim families. Um, so they would have been viewed as poor people's food by the Europeans as they arrived in West Africa, and that may well have prejudiced them, but they also would not have been seen as new foods at all. Rice, this is a different type of rice to um, Asiatic rice. Um, different type of uh, rice was eaten in the Mediterranean um, in the Middle Ages. In Northern Europe was an elite food. Um, a staple food in um, West Africa. So one of the things I've been looking at is the role of rice in medieval writings um, and connecting that to major debates about African rice in um, 18th and 19th century Atlantic history.
The yam is an interesting one. It gets confused with potatoes and it gets confused with cassava um, in the 16th century, um, both, you know, both as, a, as, as a foodstuff and the, the vocabulary used is confused. Um, it's invariably in taste and cooking compared by Europeans to chestnuts. And again, chestnuts were invariably seen as a food of poorer people. So I'm interested in some of these um, assumptions and prejudices um, expressed in writings by writers who by definition are elites on the whole, simply because they can write and they are, their writings, their descriptions have survived. So just to conclude, were medieval diets healthy? I think it all depends on how we define healthy. I hope I've shown you that an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach helps a great deal. There is no single definition of healthy and we really do need to draw together both medieval definitions and a variety of modern ones and to think about many factors that affect diet and dietary choices. And we really do need to understand medieval social determinants, both the, the cultural ones, the geographical ones, the spiritual ones, um, huge range of determinants that affect health and affect what people eat and why. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Here are just some of the acknowledgements um, for the many people who have supported this project um, over the years and all my all my research over the last decade or so.